Welcome back to another week on the trail with the John Freakin' Muir Pod. This week's episode is a very special one as we have an incredible guest for our listeners. Joining us today is Barney Scout Mann, the author of multiple books about the long trails we love, a bona fide triple crowner, the board president of the Partnership for the National Trail System, and the author of the incredible PCT memoir, Journeys North. Welcome to the pod, Scout. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here, Doc. Scout, I reached out to you on Instagram after seeing one of your posts about your memoir, Journeys North, and you were gracious enough to get back to me and agree to come, come on the pod. I want to thank you for that. I hadn't read your book at that point, but I ordered it immediately, and I have to tell you, I could not put it down. I am really excited to talk to you about it today. Real pleasure. That's why I wrote it. I wanted to bring people out there again. So um, if, if you haven't listened to the pod before, I want to give you a heads up on a regular section that we have in the, in the podcast, and that is the Pro Tip Insight of the Week alert. I'm sorry, Pro Tip Insight of the Week. Uh, this is the alert that I'm giving you. Um, at, at, at the very end of the episode, I will turn to you and I will ask you to share a pro tip with our listeners, something that you can tell them to make their next adventures uh, a little bit better, uh, more epic, um, just something that kind of stems from our conversation today. So can't plan for it right now. We have to go through our conversation and see what comes up. And then you, then you can say, okay, here it is, guys. Here's, here's my pro tip insight of the week. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's go back in time a little bit and kind of set the stage for our listeners. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm going to start off with some questions about your background, like, you know, where you grew up, uh, how big was your family? Did you guys ever do any hiking when you were younger? I mean, how did you get into the whole hiking gig? Well, if, if you were to look at a family with a little Barney, <laughs> little scout in it, you would not have predicted this guy would have been a hiker. My parents, God bless them, um, they've uh, camped out overnight five times in their life. And they might even be listening to this. And they'll say, yeah, that's true. Each time they said, no more, it's our last one. Uh, but what they did do was they took me to Boy Scout meetings. And there I had the pleasure of having some wonderful adult leaders, Mr. Massey, Mr. Quinn, Mr. Metcalf. I love saying their names today because you and I, we wouldn't be talking but for them. And I would not be sitting here being a person who is comfortable in the outdoors. I'm as comfortable, um, you drop me in the woods or drop me in the, <laughs> in the desert. I feel as comfortable out there as it would if you'd have dropped me down in the middle of a downtown uh, uh, in, in a city. And it's because of, of these men, and because of Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I did my first 50, uh, 50 miler at age 13. And if you show you a picture, you go, oh my God, what's, he's wearing all cotton. What's with that? <laughs> and where's his belly band? Hey, folks, the year was 1965. In a week, through what today would be a very popular area of the Sierra Nevada, we saw two other people. Yeah. And when I was out there, so I'm a kid, grew up in the 50s. Yeah, I'm 69, folks. Uh, and I wore a coonskin cap, which is what we did then. And I watched on Disneyland, Davy Crockett and Danny Boone. But here at age 13, I got to walk out in the real deal. I got to see scenes that were beautiful than anything on the museum wall. And the other piece for me was a personal one. I was always the smallest boy in my class. And that's not easy for a boy. I, had, I found I had to dance about as fast as I could to try and make sure I wasn't the boy who got picked on or with cooties. Um, and out there with my not yet 80 pound body and my 30 pound, five pound plus pack, as long as I kept up, I was the same as the big guys, didn't matter. And I, they showed me the same respect as anyone else because I was out there and I was keeping up and all that meant a huge deal. So it was hard, rained every day, but I fell in love with it out there at age 13. Incredible. And, and where did you grow up? What, what part of California? Culver City, um, home, of, uh, home of Fox Studios and MGM, uh, back uh, within blocks where they had the movie, movie lots. Uh, was even, there were even still some bean fields back then. It's, it's West Los Angeles, for those of you who don't know. 
And as much as Culver City has changed over those years, I'm sure that the, the Sierras, as you referenced, have, have changed uh, not, not so much in their profile, but in terms of how many people are visiting the Sierras these days. A oh, night and day. Um, uh, there was a first big wave of backpacking in the 70s. So it went from um, 1965. We climbed uh, um, uh, uh, the area of um, uh, New Army and Old Army Pass. Today, you would have, uh, especially New Army Pass, you'd have a, a, a summer day, you'd have a couple, two, three dozen who would go over it. Um, when we signed, uh, we found an old register inside a metal container uh, at Old Army Pass. The name, the names before us were 18 months before the last people have been there. So in the 70s, you had, you had this new rush, um, but especially the last, uh, you know, the last 20 years, even more so. For example, on the Pacific Crest Trail, the year Frodo and I hiked, maybe, maybe 300 people started with the intention to through hike it. Mm -hmm. uh, 2019, last year, we had a full group go out there, somewhere north of 3,500, not just 10 times, but 12, 13, 14 times, as many people set out to do that. And this is tip of the iceberg. So the numbers all uh, uh, across the board, whether it's day hiking, whether it's weekend or section, have also, have also increased markedly. That's a big change. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I really like is for a trail like the Pacific Crest Trail, uh, I've spoken to, I know many people who did done it in the uh, uh, many years before in the 90s, the 80s, and even, uh, you know, even the 70s. And, and you can feel the awe in their voice. I did, or I attempted to do something epic. And if we were to be sitting now with someone who was um, uh, tomorrow morning, they're getting up and starting the trail, they would have that same feeling. And it would be a true feeling. The trail has changed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, there's, you know, there's electronics and all this other stuff out there but it is still an epic experience, which is wonderful. Yeah, the, even, even with the electronics, the fundamental experience has not changed over the decades. Uh, and I, I found coming back off of the trail and trying to explain it to non-hikers and sharing my pictures with, with family members, they don't get it. They, they, it's, it's hard to convey it in words or in pictures. It just doesn't do it justice. The experience has to happen in order to, to feel that, that awe and that wonder. So that's actually one of the reasons why I wrote the book Journeys North is I literally wanted to carry you whether you, uh, your idea of an outdoor experience was to sit on your couch and, and look out, you know, uh, look out where it's snowing, which is perfectly fine. I wanted to give you a chance to actually feel because to, to get attached to people in the book who are doing this and to feel for a moment um, uh, what it's like. And to all aspects, both the moments of triumph and the moments where you are hurting like a son of a gun. Uh, the moments when you, uh, you're in a shower first time in three, four, five days and your body is covered with more dirt than you ever thought possible <laughs> that you could carry on you. In fact, one of the satisfying things is the second time you soap up thoroughly is you watch it go down and you can see the brown color. Yeah, to appreciate those moments and to also appreciate the different way we treat and speak to each other out there. And for any of those listening, say, oh, so you're going to through hike and that's what it takes. And that's not true. You walk to your park from your front door. And I've had people tell me this after you know, they listen to me talk and they said, oh, Scout, I actually did go out the next day and I walked to the park. And I've lived in this neighborhood for 20 years. I had, I had conversations with two different neighbors. I've never talked to in that time. And merely because you got out and started walking. Yeah. Yeah. The, the cross word or the words in anger are, are few and far between on the trail. I can, it's 13 years ago. I can tell you, not the two times I heard, because in five months, Fro and I never heard, never heard another hiker get across with each other. And we were some of those god awful conditions, pitiful. But we did hear of two instances. <laughs> one, and God bless her, wonderful young woman, was one of the few people who openly carried a cell phone in 2007. So that was back in the day. You would be ashamed 
to carry a cell phone, right? You'd bounce one in your box, bounce box. And in fact, Doc, one way you knew you were on the trail for, you'd been on the trail for a while, was we used pay phones in small towns. Remember pay phones? Yeah. <laughs> and so you'd carry a, a, a calling card. You'd have bought a thousand minutes in your calling card. Mm -hmm. And so you knew you were on a long trail when you had the calling card number memorized. Do, 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 do. Your personal 10 digit pin memorized, do, 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 do. and you knew the next two steps, press two and then three, so you could finally dial a number. And when I had it memorized, I said, You know, I've been on the trail for a thousand miles. <laughs> it's a good benchmark, yes. Yep, good indicator. Now, Scott, I mentioned that you were a triple crowner. Um, how, many, how many miles do your feet have on them? How many hiking miles uh, all told, do you think? I believe it's in the neighborhood of 15,000 to just over 16,000. Okay. Now that's from age 13 to today. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the triple crown takes you real close to a high 7,000s. Mm -hmm. But uh, every summer, um, every year since I was age 13, uh, I've hiked the backpack. Um, Frodo, if she's here, my wife, she would tell you that she wouldn't have married me <laughs> if I wasn't a backpacker when we met, so I got lucky. Another reason I need to thank uh, those scout leaders, Mr. Massey, Mr. Quinn, and Mr. Metcalf. Um, uh, we, our son, he was born, and before he turned 12 months, to my parents' chagrin, uh, we'd already taken him on three different backpacking trips. Wow. Yeah, including one, it rained coming out. We had a couple thousand feet elevation gain to lose, and it was, it was we were up about, I think 9,000 feet hiking out in the, in the San Bernardino. It's not that far from the PCT. And what is his rain cover? It's a garbage bag. <laughs> <laughs> and he falls asleep on Frodo's, uh, on Frodo's back because we, we had him warm and we had him safe. But his, his rain poncho was, you know, a garbage bag with the right, with the right holes in it. And did that kind of uh, seep into his being? Is he a, is he a, a, a through hiker now? Does, is that one of his, his hobbies, the traditions that he's carried on? Uh, it, it certainly did seep into his being. And all three of our kids uh, appreciate the doors, know how to do it. Uh, not just our son, but, but the two girls. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, our son, he and his wife, when they got married, uh, almost 10 years ago, their honeymoon was to do the John Muir Trail. Can't think of a better honeymoon. That's outstanding. Yeah. yeah. And then we, we crashed their honeymoon. And they were happy about it. What part of the trail? Um, we hiked in over, they were southbound. So we hiked in over Kearsarge Pass. Mm -hmm. and we brought them in their last four days with the food. And we brought in a real nice fresh dinner that we cooked for them. So that's why they're happy. And normally you wouldn't want your parents or in-laws interfering any way, shape, or form in your honeymoon. <laughs> and nobody's going to complain about a free resupply. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so you said fifteen to 16,000 total miles. And the, uh, the Triple Crown takes you to the high sevens. So have you, for the other eight, 9,000 miles, have they been also in the Sierras or on the Appalachian or the Continental Divide Trail? Or have you, have you experienced uh, other trails around the country or around the world? Uh, the majority of them are, are West Coast and probably the majority of that is either Sierra Nevada. Uh, but I, I was a scoutmaster for five years. Okay. And so we do a 50 miler every summer. Mm -hmm. We would do a series of, of uh, you know, 20 mile weekend training hikes. And that's in addition to what our family is doing. So there's, there's a lot of local mountains. Uh, I, today I live in San Diego and we've been going San Jacinto, San Gabriel's, uh, uh, Lagunas. There's a lot of great hiking and there's some great desert hiking too. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's mainly West Coast and mainly California based. Okay, yeah. great. Well, I mean, that's the right state for it. I mean, there's just so, so many trails available and the, the mountains are, are incredible. So, so actually, uh, I've forgotten, we have now in our latter part of our life, we've done a, a hundred miles in the Alps and enough that my wife wants to do more. And we did about 160, 170 in the Himalayas. Oh, wow. Okay. So these feet have carried, have carried me to Everest Base Camp. Uh, we have slept over 17,000 feet. You know, we, uh, uh, we have slept that we, we'd have to look way down. And instead of your, your Mount Whitney, you look down the Owens Valley, we'd be where we were. And we're looking down at the top of Mount Whitney from there. But the one piece of advice I'm going to pass on to your, to your listeners, um, I, I guess I'm doing a mini pro tip early here. Okay. <laughs> Don't wait till your late 60s to go to the Himalayas, folks. 
<laughs> it was, the air is real thin and everyone, everyone catches a colder cough. They call it the Kumba cough mm -hmm. uh, because you're hiking on a, on a trail, on trails that are uh, um, heavily impregnated with yak dust. You're breathing it all day. The only heat that you have above 12,000 feet is yak dung and it's off in the air in the tea houses. Uh, and everyone gets a Kumba cough and it's great. Now I got this awful cough and I'm in 17,000 feet air. Uh, so it, it, it was hard. It's wonderful, but it was hard. Did you say, did you say that you get the Kumba cough from yak dust from yak dung? So you're hiking a trail, which the ax, yeah, the ax poop and what they're uh, grinding into the soil, very, right. very fine soil. It's even finer than a, uh, you'll see in the PCT, which has a very fine soil that uh -huh. gets caught up in the air, but much different than the AT. Uh, and even the, and even the CT, CTT as much. So that's getting kicked up when you're breathing it all day. And instead of uh, cords of wood outside the uh, tea house door, that's what they call the rest houses. Mm -hmm. uh, they have stacked, you know, stacked, uh, stacked yak dung patties. And that's in these, in these. Uh, evidently, leaky, evidently it's combustible. Leaky iron stoves. They join the yak dung patties. <laughs> They would pour in like a like a pint of kerosene and throw in a match. <laughs> I got to tell you, Scott, you're making it sound real attractive. Amazing sights. Yes, it, it, Doc. It's the same thing on the trail. It, it, uh, uh, so often we're out there and we're in some measure of pain, blisters. You know, uh, my pack's feeling too heavy. Uh, maybe I tripped and fell a while ago, um, but we're out there because there's wonder like nothing else, mm -hmm. whether it's, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're out there. Sorry. Tea house story. Um, some of your listeners may know, but one of the other things my wife can do is we host hikers in San Diego, starting PCT hikers. And I'm going to throw out a crazy number, but it's true. We've had well over uh, 6,000 starting Pacific Crest to hikers stay in our house. It's all gratis, all free. We do it because we can. Um, so there's a lot of people out there. So we're in this tea house with our little group of our uh, five co-travelers we're with, mm -hmm. and we're having dinner. We're, at, oh, I don't know, 12,800 feet. And this guy comes up to our table and says, looks at the rest of the folks. He says, do you know who you're sitting with? <laughs> These folks, this is Scout and Frodo. They're legends. <laughs> <laughs> All the way at a tea house in the Himalayas. That's awesome. Yeah, I had seen that uh, in the, the, I think maybe it was in the epilogue of your, your book or maybe your acknowledgments where you said that you, you host new PCT hikers at your house uh, every year. And I, that's just, that's incredible. It, it's, uh, you guys have become trail angels. And I was gonna, I was gonna mention that in, in, in our discussion points here, but what, uh, that's quite an outlay of, uh, time and money and goods and uh is this it's just your way of giving back it's a lot of things mm -hmm. so one it started the year before we threw hike 2006 so it was a way that it was among other things a way to fan our own enthusiasm mm -hmm. we'll have some of these people starting this year they'll be in our house we'll take them out there uh we'll read their trail journals we'll get to know them maybe we'll go up the trail and we'll hike with them and we'll do some trail magic from which we did. We hosted 17 that year. And we thought we were hot, right? <laughs> uh, the year we threw hike, we hosted 35. And the year we came back, 2008, uh, we hosted uh, north, of, uh, uh, north of 100. And every year since then, literally about a third to 40% of that year's through hikers uh, have stayed with us. One night, two nights, three nights. We used to not have a limit, but we had to do that when we <laughs> got too high. Uh, but this, what feeds it in part, it's a way of giving back. During our through hike, we had so many moments where we were the beneficiaries of some stranger's kindness. We're sitting there on a road, hitching. No one knows, knows Adam. Um, um, and they pick us up in towns. Uh, so many times we had these wonderful um, acts of kindness come away. And to be able to give back is wonderful. These are the most amazing people in the world, if you'll beat them. They are excited. And they're scared out of their gourd. Uh, they have a chance to um, to leave our house instead of starting completely alone, which you know ninety percent of people do. You know that they, they uh, who has friends that are crazy to wander through hike. Uh, they already have maybe beginnings of a trail family. 
We've had people who met their future spouses at our house. Um, we have this army. I think I wrote uh, 81 different thank you notes to uh, various other volunteers who helped us out in all the different ways. Picking at the airport, picking at train station. It's a phalanx of uh, six to 10, 11 cars leave our cul-de-sac every morning. And only usually two, one or two cars are ours because we have all these other volunteers um, who, are help, who are helping out do it. It's a joy. Um, yeah, this year was supposed to be our last. Um, we had to cancel, of course, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. We're hoping 2021, but even that's looking dicey now and maybe we'll do it one more year in 2022, which will make it even 15 years. That's amazing. Congratulations and thank you. Uh, before we move on from the Himalayas, I wanted to ask you what it's like to sleep at 17,000 feet. Is it an easy sleep or is it, uh, is it tossing and turning headache time? Um, thankfully, I wasn't plagued much with headache. Other people do get it. Mm -hmm. um, it was more, I had, a, I had a bad cold. In fact, one of the worst colds I've had in my lifetime. And, I'm, and, and yet, <laughs> I, I literally have about a um, third, 40% of the amount of oxygen that's getting me at the same time. So that um, a lot of times it's comfortable. And for a week, for a week, the room we're sleeping in um, is freezing. I mean, fr literally below freezing. Water would freeze in our room. <laughs> um, uh, so it's all these things. And it, it was, um, uh, this trip was Frodo's idea. It was part of her bucket list. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really wanted to respect it and do that. And so for a short while, <laughs> you know, once my wake in the middle of the night or we're, we're in this uh, uh, moments where we're feeling a little bit miserable rather than the wonder of it all and she would apologize and if I told you know we need to, to, to stop this dynamic it's not healthy and it's not true um, uh, uh, A I chose it too there's so many the adventure is great but this is hard yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's just pure simple hard yes wow now, before we get to Journeys North, I want to talk a little bit about your, uh, your writing resume. I know you've done a couple of other books, uh, one about the PCT and one about, I believe, the Continental Divide Trail, or is it about the Appalachian Trail? Continental Divide Trail. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you tell us, a little, just a, uh, give us a thumbnail sketch of each of those? Uh, let's start a little bit further back in time. Okay. I can. Uh, so... During my professional life, or, or Scout 2.0, which lasted about a quarter century, I was a lawyer. Let's just get that out of the way. Mm -hmm. And if we had a, if a, we were on the trail and talking, you'd ask me what kind of lawyer I was, and I would answer a bit oddly. I would say I was a kind lawyer, uh, and I'd unpack it for you. But we're not going there. Instead, that um, before, uh, 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 before I met my partner some 20 some odd years, I set out to write the next great American novel. Uh, and who knows whether I did or not. I wrote a novel, had some real interest, but never got a signed contract. Uh, people say, oh, we want to see your next. Or two ladies write back two pages, single spaced and changes, and I'm going to do that. So I already had this drive buried deep inside that I wanted to write. And that stayed largely dormant for 25 years. And then around the time of our through hike, it woke up with a vengeance. So literally every day on the trail, I would write 500, 600, <clears throat> 700 words. I kept a journal. And uh, that journal was as important to me as my feet. And I mean it literally. Uh, if I got a day behind, I felt as uncomfortable as, as if I had a mess of blisters on my feet. Uh, it was really important. I had my uh, uh, first article published in the Pacific Crest Trail C uh, Communicator. In fact, it's the only April, Fru April Fool's uh, 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 backpacking article I'm aware of today. Uh, but that's another story. And then the day I retired, 10 years ago, the most important thing that day was, it was my first deadline for Backpacker Magazine. So from there, I started getting published, uh, uh, doing much more freelance work and such. And the Pacific Crest Trail Association uh, and specifically Mark Larrabee, who's the uh, uh, editor-in-chief of the uh, communicator, was a 25-year journalist, has a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, the publisher of the coffee table book with Pacific Crest Trail approached them. And then Mark, God bless him, uh, approached me if I would co-author him and specifically do the first half, which is largely trail history. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and you say, oh my God, history scout? <laughs> I remember history class. Give me a break. That interests you? And the answer is yes, because there are so many dear stories. I could sit here, story, wonderful people, stories that we'd either be rolling over or we both have our hankies out. Stories of people that were about to disappear because they would die, no one carrying on. And, and a lot of these people were led a part of, the, of their life. Uh, their photos, their journals, would their kids would come and go, what are these? And they get tossed. And so I, I've had the uh, opportunity to preserve a lot of things or resurrect them. Um, uh, and you'll see a lot of that in uh, both these books. The CDT book, uh, I was the sole author. And there too, one of, one of the best stories in the book was I found a guy, I couldn't believe this, who through hiked, he hiked from Mexico to Canada along the Rocky Mountain Divide in 1924. Wow. No one had heard of him. And I found him um, in the um, uh, Mazamas of Portland, Oregon. They are a, a, a mountaineering club, great club. <clears throat> Sorry. They have a, a, a wonderful library and archive. And I'd come there and I've written a number of stories based on their archive. And they love that. Someone's actually interested in, you know, our records, archives, and he writes in the Portland Oregonian and gives us credit. So this guy shared one of his treasures with me one day. He literally comes out deep in their vaults, is carrying the climbing register from the 1920s from Mount Jefferson. He is, has white gloves on. He sets it down in front of me and points to an entry. And I sit there and read, it was only one of two entries that summer, people who climb Mount Jefferson. And this entry begins with a um, description of the route the guy took and how long it took him. Mm -hmm. And then the route he's intending to take back. He, he got a little bit chatty that morning, written in, uh, I think it's in, it was in pencil. And then it ends with this, Doc, it ends with, this is the end of my journey that began on April 14th, of this year at the Mexican border in Arizona, carrying me along the entire Rocky Divide to Canada, and then over to Mount Rainier and to here. Signed Peter L. Parsons. That was the only lead we had. Wow. And it took me years to find him. Um, and the story of that is amazing too. In fact, a, um, uh, uh, someone who did a, uh, um, uh, I had some help in that, but I end up, uh, he died, this guy died in 1930. I, di I didn't know it because lots of, there's lots of Peter Parsons, by the way. I can imagine. I found, um, um, with the help of Bill Denke, and if he's listening, thank you again. Um, I found the daughter of Peter Parsons' best friend. She is 90 years old. This is five years ago, I think, four years ago. Mm -hmm. And I call her, reach her up in the state of Washington. I explain my mission, who I'm looking for information about. And the first words out of her mouth were, how many days do you have? Peter died in his 40s. His best friend, Otto Witt, kept Peter's journal. Over a thousand negatives. He kept a daily journal in 1924, this hike. She still had it. I showed up at her house within a week. <laughs> <laughs> I got to tell the story, in, uh, both in that, that uh, CDT book, mm -hmm. uh, Backpacker Magazine loved, loved it so much. We did a, a, a 40, 500 word article last January about it. Uh, so I love sharing the stories um, in the first two books, but those were largely history. And this book, Journey's North, is almost the flip side of the coin. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's taking people there today. Uh, the books, I like to say the two coffee books that you, uh, you come for the pictures, because they're gorgeous pictures. Uh -huh. I, I took a fraction. We had, a, for each one, we had about 20 other people who we invited to send us their best. And that's what we're choosing. 
uh, and, and they got paid decent money for it. The, uh, the publisher is Rizzoli International. They're actually one of the top three coffee table book publishers uh, in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I say you know, people come for the pictures, but and they'll stay for the stories. Absolutely. Now, I want to go back just a little bit here because uh, we've covered a lot of ground thus far. We're going to go to a break in just a couple of minutes here. But um, you, you talked about um, wanting to write the great American novel. And earlier you had said that with Journeys North, that you try to convey with accuracy the highs and the lows of the, of the PCT and kind of give people that those feelings. And so I, I, I of course, have not seen your, your uh, unpublished novel that, that you had written, but I want to say that you, you have the great American memoir with Journeys North because that you absolutely conveyed the highs and the lows. It felt like I was there. I was panicking for the characters at times. I was, uh, I was, I was uh, feeling the elation and, and exultation at other times. You, you did a very, very nice job with Journeys North. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think uh, with your storytelling and uh, your particular, your stories from history um, on the trail, I'm going to have to try and find a way to cajole you uh, to come back onto the pod and share a couple of those stories, uh, maybe with a different episode or episodes. You know, we, we kind of delve into the history of the trail, uh, the John Muir trail um, on the pod. And we've talked about other trails as well, but uh, we spent a little time talking about Norman Clyde and uh, how he went from being a principal in, in independence, uh, independence. Yeah. Independence and uh, getting fired from that job basically. And that freed him up to do all kinds of incredible things in the Sierras. So there's a lot of great stories out there that I would love to hear about and love to share. I enjoy that. In fact, uh, uh, take a note or two, uh, the story of Marcus Machetto, story I love telling, PCT story. Um, imagine at age 90, finding out at age 15, you'd done something really important and having people want you to come cross country to speak in front of an audience you've never spoken before. So that's, that's the teaser for Marcus Machetto. Okay. Uh, and the other one, just to make a note of, um, uh, Don and June Mulford, the first two folks to do the entire trail. 1959, horseback. And their names were lost until we found them again uh, in uh, about 2009. Okay, Scott, I've taken note. I've, wrote, I've written both of those down. And so I'm, I'm assuming this means that uh, we'll be able to have you back to, to share those stories. Twist my arm. Okay, will do. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get down into the details of the memoir, the PCT memoir, Journeys North. Stay tuned for that. And welcome back. We're back with uh, Barney Scout Mann, author of Journeys North. And we're going to take a little bit of a, 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 a deep dive, maybe a shallow dive, maybe a deep dive, see how much time we have uh, into this outstanding book. Uh, so the subject of the book is your 2007 through hike of the PCT and the publication date on the book is 2020. So there's, there's a gap of, of 13 years. What was, what was going on during those 13 years, Scout? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for one thing, building up a, um, um, a, um, um, a um, body of work. So people will even look at you in the first place, but literally from a, Six, nine months, year after I finished the hike, I was working on, on what would become Journeys North. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was my dream. It was. Uh, I easily spent a um, year and a half, not quite two years, doing the background research for it. See, okay, you know, these are people you know and you met on the trail, right, Scout? And you heard their stories there, so I can just sit down and write. And that's true, and it's also not true. Because it's one thing to be in an event with a person. Um, and so to, to, know, to, to know them and to be able to write about them, because this is a memoir, and, and it's intended to be as true to what happened as possible. Um, 
And to do that, I did over um, uh, 70 um, uh, interviews, people, and that's 70 years of people. Many of the people, especially the core characters, Blazer, Dalton, Tony and Dean, multiple times um, gave me access to, um, to uh, journals, to um, photos, photo albums. Um, and I actually, at one time, I spent, uh, I know you're an English teacher, or were an English teacher. Mm -hmm. huh? um, what, what was the format? Because I knew what I wanted, what I really want to do, I wanted to take you in a true sense so you would feel that you were there. But you can do that through fiction too. You can take people there and have them feel what it's like to actually be in this environment to experience similar things to actual people. And what I had settled on, I thought was creative at the time, was it would be like historical fiction. So it'd be set against a background, all real, real people, and I'd have their permission. Any of them. And in the foreground would be doppelgangers, would be characters who would evoke the same degree of feeling, had the same uh, typish of backstories. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, I think, you know, Blaze in particular, she would never want me to write uh, what I became privy to. And then one day Frodo, my wife, uh, looked at me and said, you've made an assumption you need to ask her. And I can recall vividly the afternoon that I did. The two of us, she knew I was working on this, um, on a book. And I asked her the question and listen to the form. Th these are the exact words. Uh, the form of the question was, Blazer, you wouldn't want me to write about you, would you? <laughs> now, counselor, that's, that's leading the witness. Objection. It's both leading the witness and it's expecting an answer, a negative answer. Right. And she looks at me and I can literally picture, this is uh, you know, 11 years ago, what she looks like as she says this. She says, Scout, I trust you. It would be okay. And it's one thing to say that. And then what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. Because what I can't have happen is a year after that, year and a half, two years, uh, all of a sudden, you know, Scott, Scott, this piece here is off limits, you know, not, not that. And, and, I mean, this is also other little slice. So we repaired for about 45 minutes and as best as we could um, talk about what that really means. As, as you'll see when you read the book, I do, I, I write with care and compassion, mm -hmm. but there are searing, searing things to happen. Uh, uh, it's probably not on your question list, but there's two people whose names I never use. I refer to them as he, or refer to him as her father. And because in the entire book, these are the two, um, these are the two bad actors. Mm -hmm. These are the, um, you know, if there's, if there's uh, people with evil acts, I, um, you know, I didn't name them, but um, she, I interviewed Blazer 20 times. Uh, and actually, we were both surprised some things that came out and, uh, and ended up in the book. Uh, Tony and Nadine Dalton have all remained true to it. Mm -hmm. um, they are all heroes in my eye. Were then and remain so. Um, and I love that they've remained true to the book. Uh, they, they have, uh, their trust and their belief in me is part of the reason uh, I was able to be there. So, Scott, you've done all the research. Now, why didn't you just sit down and write it? <laughs> and maybe there's people who can do that. Um, but I spent three years and 10 months writing the first draft. And granted, in that time, I was, uh, I think I was board chair of the Circus Trail Association, and we had lots of things going on, and I was writing other articles and such. Mm -hmm. But still, I, I worked a good portion of the time um, on finishing it. I wanted to get the first draft finished before I threw hike the CDT, which is 2015. So I can tell you it was December, 2014, I finished it. And it's one thing to finish the first draft. Then there's writing, rewriting and rewriting again. It's then sitting back, letting it uh, rest like a good roast. <laughs> uh, and then rewriting again. And then it's seeking a publisher. And this all, uh, this all takes time. Or seeking an agent and then a publisher. Mm -hmm. um, planting seeds, um, 
building up a portfolio. It was writing, you know, writing the other two books. So, hey, they're, they're coffee table books. Well, the CDT one is a 50,000 word coffee table book. <laughs> and my contribution to the PCT one, Mark Lurie did about half. And I did about 25, 30,000 words in that, in that also. Um, no small thing. And then I did book tours for both. Uh, uh, but that's, um, that's why you go from 2007 to uh, this year, 2020, in August, having actually um, actually, um, actually published. Uh, I, I actually filmed a, um, it's a short little uh, video of me opening and holding the first, uh, you know, the first uh, print run copy of Journeys North. And um, just like when I started the PCT, tears were shed. I actually hold this thing after so many years and, and not knowing because you don't know, will it actually get published? Right. Yeah. Your, your own children. I mean, it's only, there's only a nine month gestation period. This is 13. I can, I can imagine the tears flowing. Well, well deserved tears. Well earned. Incredible. So let's talk about um, just the, the basic structure of the book. It's pretty much a chronological account of the trek. Start in Mexico, you finish up in, in Canada and you have major sections of the book divided into the terrain, uh, the different types of terrain that you have encounter on the, on the PCT. It's, 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 it's almost like a, it's a split personality trail is what I've heard referred to it before because uh, there's so many different types of uh, ecosystems that you run into. And so we've got sand, dirt, granite, lava, snow. Those are the five sections. Correct. Did I get that right? That uh, that's, that's it right. why it was structured that way. Yeah, it was. I I, I will give credit where credit's due. It, it was um, uh, Frodo's idea to divide it, it, it into those sections, and I thought it was uh, when, when when she suggested it, that was an excellent way to do it. So thanks to her again. Frodo, invaluable contributions from Frodo, yeah. and, and they're they're peppered throughout the book as well. All of her uh, her contributions, fantastic. Now you're you're. Uh, your characters, so we had some major characters and we had some, some less major characters. But what I really enjoyed about the book is that um, obviously it's, it's first person when, when you are talking about your experiences, but then you're, you're talking about the experiences of the other characters uh, who may be tens, 20 miles, 30 miles ahead of you, days, days behind you. Uh, you're nowhere in proximity, but we get an insight uh, into their experience as well. And so there's multiple storylines going on that, 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 that I, as a reader, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm concerned about, you know, Blazer's journey and how it's all going to work out with, with Nadine and Tony and, and holy cow, who's, who's this Marcelo guy? I mean, there's just uh, so many rich storylines. And I, I thought, how in the world does Scout uh, get into the heads of all these people and know exactly what's happening? And you kind of shared that where you had the, uh, the extensive interviews, the multiple interviews. And I really want to give you a, a, a high compliment here from a, a former English teacher, because I, I can't remember if it's, and I, I'm going to get in trouble for my, my, my fellow English teachers out there. I can't remember if it's uh, Emerson or Thoreau who wrote about uh, Walden and the, the experience of being out in nature, being like a transparent eyeball where, you know, you're not seeing, but you're seeing everything. You're the ultimate observer. And that's kind of the feeling I got when I read this, this book is that, you know, Scout is, is uh, flitting up and down the trail and dropping in on these, these intense moments uh, on each of these characters. It, it was really, really well done. One of, when I write, uh, whether it's an article or in this case, uh, Journeys North, I write bust when I literally have 500, excuse me, when I literally have 50 to 100 times the amount of material that I can actually put into the article or book. And it's in making those hard choices that I have a chance of producing something worthy. So a, 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 uh, you know, a scene, if you will, with say Tony and Nadine, mm -hmm. or, um, I have heard from both of them and from people around them impressions. It's a bit like, um, uh, you know, these days you watch a football game and they have the camera that literally can take you in a 360 degree arc. Um, well, I've, I've been able to sit down with people and get enough perspectives 
to be able to paint that picture in, in, in words, or at least to have a really fighting chance of doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, you danced around something and okay. we backed away from it. And that was the use of the I voice when it's me and the scene. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm with these other people, um, Oh, it's, um, uh, omniscient. It's uh, what's it called? Third person omniscient. Thank you. Third person omniscient. Mm -hmm. So the first time in the first draft, when I used the word I, and I'm, this is, <laughs> this, this is the truth. It took me three days to put the first I on the paper and move on. Because at that point, unlike now, when the, the book starts out writing on Frodo's and my shoulders, at that point, the book started writing on Blazer's shoulders and fifth characters. And then on page 45 or 50, uh, uh, I come in for the first time. So how am I going to, exactly, how am I going to work this? Mm -hmm. Uh, and did I just do something very jarring? The reader has well read from this perspective to use that and all of a sudden it's I. Um, and it took me a good while to get used to that. And one of the things that happened with each one of the rewrites um, was I put myself and Frodo more and more in the book. So these days maybe we occupy a, a, a quarter, a, um, maybe a quarter, maybe a little more. Um, um, and at one time it was maybe even half that amount. And what really spoke to me in, in other people who were doing editing and saying was that the reader needs to trust you. You are the voice, you are the storyteller. And so they need to get to know you and need to get to know you right off and consistently throughout. That was a hard thing for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing with the uh, third person omniscient was especially when there were uncomfortable things, uncomfortable personal things that someone's being shared mm -hmm. for a long while I rode on the back of their quotes. All right. I got all this interview stuff and they just described the scene, you know, that's a painful thing. Uh, so I'll have them tell it. So it's, I, so I, as the writer felt a little bit safer doing it because it's coming out of their words. And if you look at each one of the drafts, um, it was me learning more and more to trust my, my narrative voice and to pair back to just, to just the best, most poignant, most meaningful quotes that fit in rather than to have three, four, five sentences that quote have maybe just the one, uh, and otherwise tell the story, tell the story, Scout. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you that uh, I didn't find it jarring at all. I, I found it unique, kind of going from that third person omniscient to, oh, now we're in first person here. And uh, it felt like we were kind of, you know, the, as the reader, I was bouncing along this trail family that was spread out, uh, you know, across a distance of, of days and, you know, 50 60 100 miles along the, the pct and it was it was i i don't it was epic that's that's, that's the word i would use to describe it it was it was, I, I i experienced the pct uh and i feel very very familiar with all sections of the pct after reading your book it was it was uh really impressive thank you and do you think that that people on the trail have a tendency to uh, open up a bit more than other folks we find in society. Cause I, we, we talked to Glenn Schweitzer a few episodes ago, who is a, a trail uh, AT trail documentarian. He's got a, a documentary coming up. Uh, he's trying to get it released uh, maybe next year. The kind of you know, the, the pandemic interfered with all with, with his plans, but he's, he's, his documentary is called trail mix. And the things that we talked about and the things that people shared with him, like you said, deeply personal, a lot of people on the trail are trying to figure themselves out or figure out something in their lives and are wrestling with, with really big issues. And yet they have no problem. Uh, in his case, you know, he, he was a guy who showed up with a video camera and a, you know, a 70 pound pack uh, on a section of the AT and ran into people and just started talking to them and, and they open right up. Every day out there, it felt like every day out there, I'd have a conversation with someone that I might have once a year with a best friend in town. Yeah. There's something different when we get out there. Uh, for one, 
we're doing the most natural thing we do, walking. What's the most celebrated event of each one of our lives? Look, she's walking. He's walking, right? We don't even remember it, but that's, you know, your first words, that's cool. And, you know, when you graduate high school, but what do they just really, really celebrate? Walking. So when we're, we're walking, mm -hmm. we have shed and left behind all these distracting things. Uh, all, uh, uh, you know, today it would be emails and so forth, but it's everything we've left behind. And this person we're, we're coming on, we know the only way you got here is that you walk too. You put up a lot of pain. We, we both belong to this pretty unique club. And so you already have this special affinity and we feel safer with each other. Mm -hmm. We've already also seen the example. We've been hiking around people and this is how we talk. For one thing, we talk about peeing and pooping and farting, right? <laughs> yeah. I, like to say, uh, I, I like to say that um, uh, on a long trail, no conversation can go five minutes without someone talking about their bodily functions. <laughs> Frodo disagrees with me. <laughs> uh, but the other thing we do is, yeah, we also, we're willing to ask deep questions. We're willing to, um, uh, to speak them ourselves. Tony and I, Tony and I are, are taking a shower side by side. <laughs> there's, there's a thin plywood wall in front of us. Uh, we're outdoors. Our shower stalls are open to the sky. Uh, from, our, from our ankles down, they're open. Uh, we're washing off four days worth of god-awful dirt with skanky soap products. We paid two bucks for a towel here at Candy Meadows. We are on the verge. We've hiked 700 miles. We're on the verge of entering the Sierra Nevada after all this time. And in minutes, we have told ourselves our deepest stories. I've told Tony about the three years. My wife and I married 43 years now. I have told Tony about the three years Frodo and I separated. And Tony there with the wind rustling in these beautiful pines tells me about the moment at the end of his 14 year marriage. He finds himself on a Saturday in the kitchen and he can sm smell the gas coming out of the open stove door and he looks down and he is holding a large kitchen knife in his hands. And he said, Scout, I don't know how I got there. And in that scene, in that setting, Tony felt safe enough to be able to tell the story. And it's a two-way street. And I felt safe enough, and listen, I felt safe enough to be able to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. I, I, those, those scenes that you just described them, uh, they're vivid in my memory from, from reading the book. Um, really big moments. And I think there is a, when we're out on the trail I and mean, we've got a lot of time on our hands, we've got a lot of time to think, we've got a lot of time to talk. And I think there's a predisposition to just open up with your trail family. And that's, that's uh, well evidenced in your book. So, Journeys North, any symbolism in that title? Where, how'd you come up with a title? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I can almost write a book about that because I went through titles. Um, and the first couple, actually, I look back now, and I almost want to say, oh, God, that was dorky. Come on, Scott, what were you <laughs> thinking? Uh, but one that, that it bore for a long time, and actually the one that uh, sold the publisher, was it was going to be called Through Hike. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the whole practical side of things come over. Um, who do you want to look at this book? When it sits there on the shelf, aside from having a nice cover, <clears throat> um, are we looking for a narrow audience or, or a broad audience? <clears throat> and I would personally, I'd like as many people as possible to experience it's why I wrote it, to tell these stories to broad audience. Um, and through hike felt like a narrow ter uh, a title. The word itself was not necessarily familiar by people. Um, and so the, uh, they, they went to their, uh, the publisher went to their, their booksellers, went to a, 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 a sampling of their book buyers and bookstores. And, uh, you know, literally um, uh, getting feelings about things. And what they latched on to next 
you know, I haven't told the story before, um, was a quote from the book. There's a moment toward the end when these 10 hikers, we've gotten kicked out by snowstorms. We're so close to Canada and we're back in town and we gel into this group. These are people who for months now have been making their own decisions, period, end of story. You know, as Frodo and I are, the two of us together making decisions. Mm -hmm. And if I want to stay in town for the next day, I stay in town. If I want to take a break here, I stay a break here. So we've, we're iconoclasts. And we form, we agree to, to work as a group, to go out next time, where we will always be in sight of each other, and like hiking, hiking all but like a train, that we'll make group decisions, we will, uh, um, we will um, uh, have a buddy because out there in, 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 in God awful uh, conditions, this was deep snow, you tend to stop, to stop drinking, stop eating, you hide your pain, all of which are destructive to the group. So you have some of them. And there's a moment in there, the chapter says that I guess it's Blazer, you know, this was, this was so out of her element. She's watching this happen around her. But she did sense the moment it, it happened. And the moment was when Chigger, young woman hiker, pipes up, let's hear it for Team Snowplow. And the way that paragraph ends with, um, we'd hike as one. And so that was the next title they chose, we'd hike as one. Uh -huh. And we were all really sold on it. We'd hike as one, colon, the Pacific Crest Trail. Yeah, it's great, all right. Um, and then, you know, PB sit back for two weeks and we had a hard time, well, is it present tense or past tense? <laughs> and then again, you're looking at it from other perspectives. Um, <clears throat> and a, um, uh, a second title that had been proposed, I believe, was the Pacific Crest Trail, colon, Journeys North, or, or Journeys North along Pacific Crest Trail. Mm -hmm. And someone came out of their office, it wasn't me, someone uh, up there, sorry, someone came out of their office and said, it's Journeys North. And then we went down the hallway and people said, of course, it's been sitting in front of our face. Um, and that's how it happened late in the process. But that's with many book titles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you start off with a working title and it, it uh, evolves or, or changes drastically and, and you come up with Journeys North. Yeah. So in reading the, in reading the book, um, I thought this was going to be a novel about Scout and Frodo going from Mexico to... Canada, and it was to, to some extent, but I think the main character, when I, when I put the book down, I said, you know what, the main character of this book was Blazer. This was, this was, this was a story about Blazer. We, we experienced so much with her from, from the beginning to her backstory to the, you know, the terrible things and overcoming and just ultimate, um, I don't want to say redemption, but you know, it, it, it had a, I don't want to spoil the book for anybody, but it, it, it worked out. And that was the, the long story arc that I kind of uh, gravitated towards most and, and said, you know, Blazer was the main character. Everybody else had great stories. There was a lot of drama going on on these other storylines, but I, th I felt that, that Blazer was the main character. Was that, was that your intent? Is, do you agree with that or, or disagree? I, I agree with it. And the, the heart of Blazer is really the heart of, of, of going out on a long trail. It really is. Everyone on long trail experiences and has, and, and, and it has a lot of difficulty thrown in their way. No one, no one has an easy through hike. And Blazer, her life up to that point, had so many, so many ways been that, that external things happened to her, uh, slap her down, it'd be easy not to get back up. And this young woman, this young woman had somewhere deep inside her, she always, she always picked herself back up and strove for the light. I loved it about, loved it about her to this day. Um, uh, um, and it's so nice that so much is going right for her these days and hasn't for a while. Uh, and it's been so easy not to, so easy to be down on life. So, um, and yet repeatedly she did. And to 
get closer to under trail and see and learn more about this and to see the particular events on the trail that also were. Yeah. Uh, and so actually at one point, even a, a larger percentage of the book was about her. Um, but as, as um, Fro and I had to, had to come more in the foreground, that was one of the things, as well as the book, book, the book length itself. You're an English teacher. Mm -hmm. You have any? All right, trivia question for you. Uh oh. All right. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, Catch 22. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Joseph Heller. Any idea from the moment the book was submitted, bought by the publisher, so it's already been edited and re edited, how much of the length of that Pulitzer Prize winning book was cut? Mm, that I don't know. Over one quarter of Catch-22 wow. ended up on the cutting room floor in an already, you know, reasonably polished state. Yeah. Right. That, that so, uh, kind of, and actually kind one of the hardest things I did along the way was, was stories to cut out. Yeah. I actually just, um, at Eagle Rock, which is an iconic place in the PCT, unlike uh, places uh, that are called um, Indian Knob or uh, uh, Elephant's Nose, you have to either squint to look at them or maybe you've had a few drinks to look at them and say, oh, I see the elephant's nose. Indian Rock, 107 miles north Mexican border. You turn and you see it, and this thing is the size of a barn, eagle with its, with its, with its wings outspread. But what I was getting at is I went out there before sunrise. It's, it's, it, uh, Wade's got out there, and one of the things I did was I filmed um, a couple of, uh, me reading a, a couple director cuts for Journeys North. Um, and one of them was to Terry and Joe Anderson, two wonderful trail angels. Uh, they've had thousands of people through their house. I had to cut the section on Terry and Joe. Um, there is a um, um, beautiful, poignant, sad story about two hikers who hiked in 1995, Sobos, uh, Shane and Flicka Rodman. It's actually the only named, I think, endowment Pacific Crest Trail Association uh, because they died in the trail. Mm -hmm. And I had to cut that section. Uh, but to, um, uh, I, I read these out there with Eagle Rock in the background and I intend to uh, I post them on in Instagram, you know, director cuts for those you want to get the inside story. Yeah, who do I have to call at the, uh, the publisher to get an unabridged version of, of Journey to Apple? And actually, many of these, uh, I'd already done the painful hard work before they saw. Did I tell you? I don't think so, no. Um, I cut out a full chapter on my saving a hiker's life. Um, Burning Man, I literally did. Um, because what it did was, great story, is well, the really true um, and hard. But it, if you're the reader, you're going along and this pulls you to the side and then brings you back to the story arc. And I think I had to be kicked up the side of the head a couple, three times before I finally took it out. Mm -hmm. But they were right. A story for another episode, Burning Man. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna make a note, Scout. <laughs> so we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we're gonna get down into, uh, we're gonna play some free association with Scout on some of the more memorable moments from the book. Just gonna, I'm gonna list some some of the events and just to give him uh, a few seconds to to respond and give his thoughts on each, and we'll talk about uh, just briefly some of the dedication and effort and planning it took to become a triple crowner. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. And welcome back. So let's talk about uh, some of the more memorable moments from Journeys North that really stood out in my mind. Really, really uh, epic scenes with um, fraught with danger or excitement or just in incredible incredibleness. Is that a word? I don't think so, but uh, along those lines. First, uh, tell me your thoughts on the outhouse dinner. Ah, uh, so this is, <laughs> this is a poster child for the book. Because one of the things I like to say, um, you know, if you give me an elevator speech, it's literally, here's what I want to do. I will take someone who's never had any experience with trail, and I want them to feel for a moment what it's like to be sitting inside a pit toilet outhouse 
it is nasty outside. It is blowing like a son of a gun. It's colder not get out. And you are in this pit toilet outhouse with your head about two feet away from the white, white throne, wearing every stitch of clothing you have. You're huddled over your little alcohol stove with its weak flame, trying to get your dinner to boil. And you're sitting there and you are happy. Yeah. And the next thing that happens, because that's Tony, next thing that happens is he hears crunch, crunch, and the door is open. And there's Scout, because I came to the same decision, Tony. This is the only protection. Uh, we were in high desert, there's no plant above two or three feet tall. We have nowhere to get protected from the wind. And if we want a hot dinner, and then we want to be a little bit out of the wind for a short while, this was it. And so I opened the door, and Tony said, oh, hi, Scout, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> and there we are in the corner yeah all right how about uh, if i mention trail angels what do you think about from that 2007 trip i think about um a doctor and his wife who frode and i have looked at sonora pass for 45 minutes hiking down to it seen maybe two or three cars we know this is a notorious hard hitch we have to get 10 miles to the west and this is going to take time. Give me a break. And we are hungry. We have to pick up some resupply here. And we get down the Sonora Pass, 10,000 feet. And we look at each other. Where should we stand? And all of a sudden, the voice calls out. It's from a SUV that's parked a little ways away. And it calls, are you through hikers? Yeah. It's Vivian. And I forget the doctor's first name. Every year, they would come up to Berkeley Sierra Camp. They were, uh, they'd gone to Berkeley and they'd be at 5,000 feet. It would be hot. And one year, 10 years before us, they drove up to get away the heat. They go to the highest spots in our pass and they sat there and all of a sudden these scruffy people came out of the woods and they go, Yo, who, who are you? You hiked from Mexico? And they picked them up, took them to lunch and had the time of their life. And so every year, once they would do that again. And so that morning, at some point, they got in their car, they drove up to Sonora Pass, and Frodo and I walked out, and we were that year's beneficiaries. Nice. How about Goat Rocks? Ding, ding, ding. Um, I think of Nadine tied up to her dog, Pacha. Uh, that year, only one trail dog uh, started beginning with the attention to hikes, it's a hard thing to do. And I won't get into that debate because people do argue about whether you should have dogs to trail or not. I won't, I won't go there. Um, Pacha was great. And hiking to the Goat Rocks, you were on an exposed edge with a, uh, 800,000 feet drop on both sides. It tends to be very windy, gorgeous. It's the scene, it's the scene off a of US postage stamp, literally the world's longest trail. And it has Goat Rocks, Knife Edge, and then a Mount Rainier in the background. Um, and yeah, I shouldn't even start with these goat rocks. There are also these great mountain goats there. Well, one short story about Nadine. Uh, Frodo's best friend called her a, a while back, and she's uh, partway through uh, uh, a journey's north. And she just looks and Frodo says, you know, I, I'm in the middle of something. Can I get back to you? Karen says, no, you need to tell me right now. It, is Pacha okay? <laughs> is Pacha's not okay? I'm putting down the book right now. <laughs> I had that same level of concern. I, I know exactly what she's talking about. All right. So let me share with you all. Potch is 15, still alive, has slowed down some. She's with Nadine. Nadine wins the winery and Pachi, we could still sit down. She'd be there and, and, and curled up and a uh, wonderful dog. Nice. Wh which winery? Oh, uh, Soter. Uh, I think S-E-U-T-E-R. Um, they brought Nadine to, tr to uh, convert them over to a... a, a purest, uh, organic, uh, organic, sustainable farming. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you know what part of California that's in? Or is oh, it in Oregon. California? Oregon, uh, 45 minutes south, south and a little bit west of uh, Portland. Got it. Okay. Great wine country. Thank you. Now, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this next one correctly or not. So help me on this. Uh, Seattle, the Seattle River. Seattle. Seattle. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Do we go or don't we go? That was the question. During our years, uh, uh, we were still subject to a, uh, the 2003 supposedly once in a thousand year flood 
that blew out bridges 45 miles the trail, extreme northern uh, uh, part of Washington, Glacier Peak area, 100 miles of trail that's not crossed by a road. And 45 miles, they, they didn't have an official closure. It's not that many people are going on it. <laughs> in, in those days, they didn't officially close the trail. Um, no one had been uh, going up. There were a couple of detours. They were pretty skanky, road walking, uh, cross country and stuff. We had heard that there was finally a log across the Seattle. Because literally the bridge that used to cross it, they built the bridge for a thousand year flood. Uh, I've seen pictures of it. And you could, the U.S. Cavalry, two abreast, could thunder across that bridge. Uh, it was uh, steel girders like they'd have in a tall building. The uh, wood planks, I think, were, you know, four-inch thick wood planks. This thing was built to last. The thousand-year flood didn't just hurt it. It literally blew it off its mooring, its foundations, and carried it hundreds of yards downstream. Uh, the Suyala was a tough, was a tough river. Glacier melt. Uh, you couldn't see the bottom, and the whole way people talked about it. You know, it's like, it's like the boogeyman under the bridge. Right. Oh, what, what are we gonna do? Suyato River. Oh my gosh, it's there. But a log had fallen across it, and we had heard uh, some reports of people doing it. And we got there. We were lucky enough to actually talk to someone, a southbounder who had gone through it, because we weren't fools. Uh, by that point, you don't make it that far if you're a fool. Um, and we talked to her. Um, had this, rumors of reports, a couple people had gone northbound. When we got to the deciding point, there was a, a handwritten Forest Service note, literally with, I think, three pleases in it, don't take this route, uh, and a description of a, in the area, a rescue going on. But we decided to go. Uh, in that 45 mile stretch, there were 423 blowdowns. I remember it. I'm not making that number up because we counted everyone because we had to make a game of it or hate them. And I'd rather make a game of it. And the Sui Arado River, uh, uh, if your readers are watching, I could show you a little, uh, uh, a little, little video of Frodo on this fat log scooching her way across, probably a hundred plus scooches. Blazer walked, scared the pants off all of us. I was the first one to get to it. I started out walking. You know, this is not flat top. This is a log that fell across and it's been there for a while. So the surface is not like some of the sand for you. I get a third of the way across and I'm going, and I, think, think, and I think to myself, this was stupid scout, but I only got one way to go. And so I just kept on my momentum and I went across it. Yeah, that is a, that's a vivid scene in my memory from the book uh, that scooching scout, uh, uh, Frodo scooching across the, the log. And I'm hoping that you'll be, you'll be willing to share with me some pictures of your 2007 trip that I can post on, on my social media as a, a teaser to, to the episode. So that'd be great. Happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, how about, how about the cave? Oh, gosh. I haven't thought about the cave for a while. <laughs> so I get a phone call. Uh, we're at uh, 1,600 miles up the trail. It's been hot. We went on the Hot Creek Rim. It has been hot again. We've mm. had blisters again like we hadn't had in a while when going to the Sierra Nevada. It's been hot. And we've had some long waterless sketches, sketches. And the phone calls from Sleuth, section hiker who I met two months before. And she says, Scout, how would you like to have a refrigerator experience? I go, huh? And she proceeds to describe for me the secret cave. Just off the PCT gives me directions. They're not easy directions. And a couple, three days later, when we get there, um, I run into a Boy Scout troop that's just leaving the area. And they spent the day before. They knew it was in the area and searching for it. And they didn't find it. Um, it's in a limestone area. And I had within a couple hundred feet of description. And Frodo agreed to give me 20 minutes. And the description basically was along this, this um, cliff front at the base of it uh you'll f there are a lot of holes because it's, it's limestone but one of the holes there's a six foot drop <laughs> and that's it well all these holes were covered with branches and stuff and uh and what i had is i guess at that point we were oh and i, I had my camera and so literally I, i'm on my belly trying to reach my way in and i take the camera and i take a flash photo in there Literally 20 minutes up, I find it. 
Frodo wasn't interested in going down. I, I was a Boy Scout Scoutmaster and I'd actually uh, uh, trained in spelunking, even in San Diego, there's a couple caves down here. And I had my three points of light, she sat at the mouth and I go into this thing and literally outside it's already, it's 9.30, it's already 85, you know, degrees heading up to 90, 90 plus. Inside that cave has got to be 50 degrees. I'm wearing my watch cap. I carried him my three points of light. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing. Just amazing. I can hear the excitement in your voice as you oh, relive I just, that. I found it. Well, <laughs> and I, I went back a year and a half ago with the two other people. And I tried to find it again. We couldn't. And, and I, I looked online. Uh, what, what you'll find online now is rumors of it. You know, you'd expect to see photos and such. It, 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 it likely has reverted into being, uh, into being lost. Hmm. And how, how big was the inside of the cave? Uh, the large room I, I, I got down into fairly soon was probably a 18, 20 foot ceiling, um, uh, 25, 30 foot wide. And then I didn't go back in deeper, but there are other caverns to go back in deeper. Wow. So you, you dropped in six feet down by yourself in this, this hidden cave. You, you are a madman scout. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like to think there was decision making going on and that um, the things I could, con could control, I did. Well, it all worked out. You're here telling me about it. So I did. Okay. How about one more? The storm. Which one? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the one that stood out for me was the, the storm at the end where the, the snow started to accumulate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was a series of storms. Uh, once a generation early. And I, I looked it up. I, lo I, I looked at a, a um, uh, I think it's called the snow tail system. I spoke to a, a, I spoke to a head weatherman in the state of Washington. You know, I'm not making this stuff up if I was how early and how rare it was. You are usually safe to finish the PCT by October 15th. I've seen photos of people, Canadian border wearing sunscreen on October 31st. We plan to finish on October 2nd. We were all set to do that. Mm -hmm. September 29th. September 29th. We are 60 miles from Canada at Brainy Pass, and it started to snow. Wow, nice pictures. I get up. And I start knocking the snow off on our tent. And at that point, unbeknownst to us, they are lined up coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. One, two, three, four. Each separate by, separated by maybe two days, two days max. And they're about ready to knock us silly. Yeah. Um, one of the hardest moments was uh, the first time I had to turn back. You know, I'm 55 miles from Canada. I know snow backpacking. I know snowshoe backpacking. I've taught it. Five of our buddies have already turned around. They're heading back down, and I'm facing them. Blazers with us. Blazers zip it for, zipper from her jacket is broke. She has lost the glove at this point. Uh, she has announced that I'll do whatever F Scout and Frodo do, and I talk for ten minutes out there. It's whiteout conditions. The snow is uh, as we climbed up this pass has gone, you know, up and above our ankle. Drifts are higher. We turn around, and after I talk for 10 minutes, I take one step south, and something breaks inside me. I stop again, and I start talking again. And after a minute or two, Frodo does something. She's only done once in our entire 40 years of marriage. We had a tacit agreement that uh, uh, each of us is the most important person to the other, and if one of us ever, um, 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 each of us had the veto power. And Frodo, literally, that's what she said. After two minutes, I'm, I'm talking again. And they're waiting. And Frodo says, Scout, that's it. I'm exercising my veto. We're heading back. And I stopped talking. And we walked away from Canada the first time. Heartbreaking. Well, congratulations, not only on the trip, but on the book, how, how well it was written. Um, as you're describing things, I have these vivid memories. If that's any indication to our listeners out there about, uh, about the quality of this book, I, I see exactly the images that you're describing from my time uh, reading the book. 
And what I want our listeners to do right now is to pause, hit the pause on, on the auto recording on the podcast right here. And I want you to go on Amazon and order your copy of Journeys North. You will not be disappointed. Go ahead, hit pause right now. Amazon.com, Journeys North, written by Barney Scout Man. You will not be disappointed. Okay. Now that you've done that, welcome back. And we're going to wrap things up uh, in short order here. I want to talk just briefly about uh, how you became a triple crowner. You did the PCT in 2007. And then eight years later, you did the Continental Divide Trail. And then the AT in 2017. So you, you took a little while between the first one and the second one, but you wrapped it up pretty quick uh, after that. Yeah. <clears throat> Last month on the trail, a long trail? A not unusual question people ask each other. Uh, uh, so you going? Uh, um, are you going to do another? <laughs> and and I and my answer would be even at that point was um, that uh, I would hope so. I would hope so. And Frodo was very clear that she had one long trail in her. Um, she knew I wanted to do this, and I'm starting to get on a bit. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm I'm starting to stare at my early sixties. And a year and a half before the CDT, Frodo, without having a discussion with me, literally starts telling people, Scout's doing the CDT in 2015. Um, and when people want to ask me about because I'm focused on writing the book, right? I'm focused on being a, 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 a um, I'm focused on my next article, focused on we're trail angeling uh, for all these people. Um, and people would come up and they wanted to talk to me about, oh, she's doing the CDT. I said, yes. And Frodo's authorized to talk about it. Um, she did, uh, she just did some part of the planning and uh, itinerary for that trip. And she hiked 600 miles with me. Um, and then when I came off that, uh, within about six months, she did the same thing for the AT. She said, Scout's doing the AT in 2017. She knew I wanted to do this. I did the AT Sobo, a um, lot of reasons. Um, uh, fewer people Sobo, uh, more unique Sobo. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, the people I know said, Scout, there's black flies. And the first day you're hiking the hardest part of the trail. Are you crazy? And I guess you're right. There's a little of that streak in me. Um, but the guy I started out hiking with, Rolling Thunder, great guy, journalist. Uh, uh, he actually did a, was a uh, big help. And uh, one of the editors I would turn to for Journey's North, Rolling Thunder, wrote me a couple months beforehand. He said, Scout, because he also had done the CDT and the PCT, and the AT was going to be his uh, last of the Triple Crown. He said, Scout, we have always started at an international border. So let's start at the Canadian border. You know, let's not start at Mount Katahdin. And some of you may know there's an international Appalachian Trail, which continues on from the northern terminus of the AT and follows the old uh, 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 chain of the Appalachian Mountains back when the, I think it was Pangaea, when it was all one landmass. So literally the international AT continues north through Maine to Nova Scotia, doesn't end at the ocean, goes through Iceland, Greenland, picks up in Northern Europe and ends in Morocco. <laughs> Wow. Uh, it first came, the idea first came in the guy's head in 1995. So it's, it's a fairly new thing. But we hiked the first uh, 145 miles. We started at Fort Fairfield, hiked uh, south. We saw only two other hikers in the 145 miles. Uh, came up the backside of uh, Katahdin. So we did the knife edge in Katahdin, which was cool. And you can hear my voice now. I'm just tickled pink that we did it. Um, it was an another way to make... Uh, uh, this third long trail, a unique experience myself that helped carry me the whole way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of the three, I'm going to pin you down here. Favorite trail? Hands down, Pacific Crest Trail. Not just because Frodo tells me I have to say it. Because <laughs> it's the one I did with her. No, it's, it's um, wilderness, but it's still approachable. Um, it's wild but not as wild, <laughs> it's not, 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 not as completely wild as the CDT. Uh, uh, mile for mile, the landscape and the views 
uh, higher percentage than a CDT. And of course, AT is the green tunnel, especially for the southern, uh, uh, southern uh, 1700 miles. Yeah. So I, I love the other two very much. Had a great time. But PCT is my favorite. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, have at least one question asking you about your work on the Partnership for the National Trail System. What's that all about? Partnership National Trail System is the umbrella group for all 30 national scenic and historic trails. So we've talked about three of those. There are 30 congressionally designated national scenic and historic trails, letting scenic, AT, PCT, CDT, North Country, Ice Age, Arizona, uh, and so forth and so on, and 19 national historic trails. Uh, very few of them are as well tended for, have as large support groups, private nonprofit support groups as the AT and PCT. Uh, and the part of the National Trail System uh, uh, gathers them together under one tent. Uh, we lobby. We represent, we are able to speak with one voice to the uh, federal agencies, Forest Service, BLM, and Partnership, able to uh, fund things such as in, uh, interns. We go back and lobby Congress every year. We bring back, uh, together with American Hiking Society, uh, bring back over 100 people to have meetings in literally every, almost every member of Congress's office. Uh, we get a face-to-face -face meeting with the chief of the U.S. Forest Service. I had a 90-minute meeting with her and with our delegation. Uh, uh, she came to our evening function at night. I told a story at the end. I had her dabbing her eyes with tears, and then she boosted it out in her weekly report to her uh, 30,000 staff. Um, when we go back, those 30 trail organizations, um, total, their folks donated over 1 million volunteer trail maintenance hours. Because that's what it takes. Yes. Trails every year, washout, overgrown. You know, section O in the PCT, the person disappears 10 feet in front of you because it gets overgrown. It needs to be cut back every year. Uh, over 150,000 people in those 30 member trail organizations uh, donated over $15 million for trails in one year. So when we go back and talk to members of Congress, it's not gimme, gimme, gimme. It's let me tell you about our gift to the American people. And this is a government-private partnership that really works. And it sells across the aisle. It's both sides. Thankfully, we were able to get some real good work done. Uh, and I do it because I realized I have, a, I have this lawyer skill set. I can do, quote, the suit thing fairly well. I have this real passion and love for it out there. Um, and uh, uh, so I've ended up, I was uh, on the PCTA's board. And... Uh, was its board chair, was on the Continental Valley Trail Coalition's board, and up until March was its board president. I'm privileged to be able to do this work and to be able to help do it. So um, uh, whether we have grandkids or we have grand nieces and nephews or just uh, friends with such, that the next generation and the next generation after that, there'll be someone like you, Doc. Now, maybe you don't call them podcasts then, but they'll be interviewing someone else who that year went out and hiked from Mexico to Canada because it still exists. Well, on behalf of the national trails and the day hikers, section hikers and through hikers out there, thank you. Thank you for all you're doing. And you're welcome. You're welcome. Scout, you know where we are? We're near the end. Oh, 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 we are at the uh, ding, ding, ding. We are at the pro tip of the week. That's right. Pro tip inside of the week. What do you have for us? Mental. Real close second would be my trail umbrella. In a rainstorm, you come up to me and flash $10,000 in front of my face, I will laugh at you. I love my umbrella. I feel like I'm a, I'm, I'm a superhero, I'm, I'm an umbrella man. You are walking in front of me and you have your little saddy face inside your hood. And I'm umbrella man, I'm dry down my waist. But that came in a close second. Mental, because really, whether you're day hiking, overnight, week, section, or through hiking, what really matters out there, what gets you out there, will get you to come back and we'll see to it you have a good time or not. It's not the best piece of gear in your, in your pack and it's not how much and how well you're trained. It's your attitude. And so every moment you want to get out, cherish that, 
find ways to find the fan, the flames. You say, well, scout, how would I do that? I'll tell you one simple way, plant some surprises for yourself out there, some special treats. Frode and I shaved our heads in the midpoint, the PCT. I looked forward for that for two and a half months and it was be a surprise for her. The special person you're gonna meet, the special treat you've put in, you know, you put deep in your pack. The last day on the CDT, I had carried now, uh, I had now carried in from Kmart, I spent two and a half bucks and this, uh, uh, I love this, love the thought of this. Cause I asked these guys, last the CDT, we are at 11,000 feet. And I say, and this windy bluff, having lunch, said, don't you think, wouldn't it be fun if, you know, to fly a kite from out here? These are all adults. You know, the last time they flew a kite was 20 years ago. And I proceed to pull out of my pack two kites, 300 feet of string on each, Superman and Wonder Woman. And we're like little kids. We put that up and put it out. This was five books worth of fun. And it carried me how many miles. And today, how many you know, times have I told the story again? So mental, take care of that. Find ways to make the trail fun for you and those around you. There's my pro tip. Scout, I have to tell you, that's one of the best pro tips we've ever had. That's, that's outstanding. Thank you. So there you have it. That's it. Episode 45 is in the books. I hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Scout, and I want to thank him for joining us this week. Scout, how can our listeners keep up with you and Frodo on social media, and where can they find updates on your latest adventures? Uh, very easy. Um, BarneyScoutMan.com uh, It's my website. Uh, that'll lead it. And love to have you follow me on Instagram. That's where I tend to post my best stuff. And there it's the book title with the dot in between. Journeys dot north instagram uh, pop on send me a message uh, uh uh on the website become a subscriber and maybe once a month i pop out with some news i would love to hear from y'all that's what i did i followed him on instagram and sent him a message and look look what we're, look where we are now good stuff remember to check out the pod on social media as well we are on facebook youtube instagram and twitter and if you have comments or clips you want to share you can send it to me at john at gmail.com also, if you're enjoying the podcast, take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself, right, Scout? <laughs> That's right. We'll keep that a secret, just between us. That's right. That's a wrap from the John Freakamere Studio. Any final thoughts, thoughts Scout? No. I hope to see each and every one of you someday out on the trail. Well said. Thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you're at 17,000 feet and marching in yak dust with a Kumba cough. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck. <laughs>